Welcome back to Quick Bits. This week, we covered two motions in the Rust case, Alec Baldwin's motion to dismiss the indictment and Hannah Gutierrez Reed's emergency motion for new trial. I also covered a hearing in the Brian Koberger Idaho University murders case. And Corey Richens, was her mom involved in the alleged fentanyl poisoning death of her husband? There's an unsealed search warrant that I also covered. We need to break it all down. Let's get into it. I'm legal analyst Emily D. Baker. This is the Quick Bits, where I break down just the main points of the pop culture and entertainment cases I'm currently covering on YouTube and the Emily Show podcast. Let's get into it. One of the things I love so much about Quick Bits is that I can update you on things that have happened since I live streamed on my long form channel at the Emily D. Baker and give you the thought out summary of what I've covered in the week. And there is some new information because we have some updated responses in the Rust case. So we're going to talk about that first because I wanna bring you a new hearing date and the prosecution's response to this motion from Hannah's lawyer that is wow. So let's talk Hannah Gutierrez's emergency motion for a new trial. Hannah's lawyer, Mr. Bowles, filed this motion that said, in summary, yo, your honor, there's this new New Mexico Supreme Court decision and you have to dismiss the case because it says so. There's very limited argument, very limited facts. And on live stream, I went through and read the entire New Mexico Supreme Court ruling and disagree with Mr. Bowles's uh, interpretation of that Supreme Court decision. As best I can summarize it, Bowles said that the Supreme Court determined that any jury instruction that uses the and slash or in a sentence leaves open too many possibilities and therefore any case that uses that must be overturned. In the Supreme Court case, it was a very different situation than Hannah's case where the and or left open possibilities that the defendants in that case could have been convicted on things that were not illegal. That was the underlying issue in the Supreme Court's ruling. That's not what happened in the Gutierrez case. He also said that he preserved this issue by objecting at the time. Well, that's not what the prosecution says. The prosecution has filed a somewhat snarky response on March 20th, 2024, saying, quote, defendant's threadbare motion request a new trial based on the erroneous distillation and application of a recently issued New Mexico Supreme Court opinion. Although the defendant's motion is thin on facts and arguments, I mean, accurate, the state will do its best to address the issues raised in Taylor, the Supreme Court case, as it may apply to the defendant's jury instruction. On the outset, and as more fully explained below, the defendant's motion attempts to condense a 33-page opinion into a simple premise that any jury instruction containing the conjunctive term and slash or is factually invalid and entitles her to a new trial. It also goes on to make clear that from the prosecution's point of view, the defense never objected to the jury instruction in Hannah's case that used that and slash or conjunction. While this might feel like deeply legal wrangling, I find it very interesting to break down what the Supreme Court did rule on and how it differs from the way the defense argued it. Yes, this is very much at the heart of what lawyers do. They look at these opinions and argue where they are either in line with what they're arguing for or where they are distinguishable from what they're arguing for. So Tuesday's stream felt very much like a day at Lawnard University Law School. And when it comes to the issue of whether Hannah is going to get a new trial based on that and slash or objection, we don't have to wait long to see what the court is going to do because the court just set a hearing for Friday, March 29th at 10 a.m. local time in New Mexico. Yes, I will be breaking that hearing down on YouTube. So stay tuned and don't forget to tune in on Friday. Remember, if you are interested in staying in the loop on everything that I am streaming and the cases that I'm covering, 
The Lawnard app will get you there. Lawnardapp.com or go to your app store and just put in Lawnard. You will find the app. It is free. It will notify you of when I'm streaming and what I'm streaming about so that if you have time to catch the stream, you can, or if you just need to catch the quick bits, you can, or all. So don't forget to go download the Lawnard app today. Let's talk Baldwin. And you might notice that Tuesday's live stream is almost five hours long because I also went through some of Alec Baldwin's motion to dismiss. And I say some because the motion and exhibits is over 700 pages long. So I'm going to do a deep dive on that on the Emily Show podcast so I can not only go through it and summarize it for you, but explain the key points of the legal arguments and the law as it is in the state of New Mexico and where this motion might go that I could not do on the live stream when we were doing a first look, which included a very snarky motion for sanctions and the motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment, arguing again that the jury instructions to the grand jury in Baldwin's indictment were incorrect. And you've heard me say time and time again that when jury instructions are incorrect, it is probably the most likely scenario where something can be thrown out or overturned. So we will be breaking that all down on The Emily Show this week. What we also learned from that filing is that Alec Baldwin, before the second indictment when he was recharged, was offered the same plea deal Dave Hall's was, a misdemeanor with six months of unsupervised probation. And they say that the prosecution withdrew that plea offer 10 days before the deadline that they had set and then went ahead and indicted Baldwin. There is clearly no love lost between Carrie Morrissey, the prosecutor you watched in the Hannah Gutierrez retrial, and Alec Baldwin's attorneys. If this goes to trial in July, it will be fascinating to see these attorneys in court together because reading their emails back and forth, it is very, it is very sassy, very snarky, and it will be very interesting. A huge thank you to today's quick sponsor, Lumi. And if you hadn't heard, body odor is officially canceled for good this time. Unlike certain other deodorants, Lumi whole body deodorant is powered by mandelic acid to deliver outrageous 72-hour odor control everywhere from your pits to your feet and everything in between. It's not a surprise that Lumi was invented by an OBGYN to take care of all of your body odor concerns. I personally love their solid deodorant tube, but I also really like taking the deodorant wipes on the go, particularly for those long travel days but my kids take them to all kinds of events, especially if they need to just kind of tamper everything down after their activities. We have a special offer for you QuickBits listeners where you will get $5 off your starter pack with code EDBQB, like Emily D. Baker QuickBits, right? At lumideodorant.com. And with the starter pack, you get to try the solid stick deodorant, the cream tube deodorant, and two free products of your choice like those deodorant wipes that my family loves so much. So make sure you head to lumideodorant.com. New customers get $5 off when you use code EDBQB. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack at lumideodorant.com. So now that we've handled your bits, let's get back to the quick bits. In Idaho, I covered the Koberger hearing that had happened on February 28th. I was busy covering the Hannah Gutierrez Reed trial and did not want to break from trial to go cover that hearing in Idaho. So I covered it now that the Hannah Gutierrez trial is over. It was a hour, 20 minute ish hearing. Most of the hearing was over discovery and setting dates. Some of the hearing was over disclosures of that IgG DNA and what can be disclosed to whom on the defense team because there are protective orders in place and they all seemed to work that out. So much of this case has been under seal that it's really hard to get a good sense of where they are and things until they have these hearings where they're talking about scheduling witnesses, the trial and the discovery and the ongoing discovery issues. We learned from that hearing that there is still outstanding discovery. The prosecution has said that they are turning things over to the defense as soon as they get them from law enforcement, but there are still things outstanding from law enforcement that they are hoping to turn over. The defense made an analogy in that hearing that this case is like playing a game of 52 card pickup where you take a deck of cards and throw them up in the air and then try to pick them up in order. 
her analogy was that it was like playing a game of 52 card pickup with a thousand decks of cards and the backs of all the cards are the same because of the way the discovery has been coming in. Remember the discovery in this case is over 51 terabytes of data and for context, and this was left in the comments on that stream and thank you to the lawner that left it, that is more than double the terabytes of the Library of Congress. It is a mind boggling amount of information. And so the defense keeps pointing out how difficult uh, their task is to get ready for this case to go to trial and keeps arguing for a trial date in late summer 2025. The court had said that they believe the prosecution was shooting for a March date in 2025, and the court still has not set a trial date. It seems that the court would like to leave open the possibility that this case could go to trial before July, August of 2025. But given everything the defense attorney has said, given that this defendant has waived time, they can't rush the defense to trial on a death penalty case. It just creates an issue for appeal, and we are now over a year and a half out and the defense still doesn't have all of the discovery. So I understand their arguments, though it's frustrating how long this case is taking, but this is not unusual for a case of this size and a case where the death penalty is at issue because there is substantial amount of work the defense must do to get ready for both the guilt phase of the trial where he is found guilty or not guilty and the penalty phase of trial. There are two completely separate trials the defense is prepping for here. So I get it. It's also really nice to see the demeanor of all of these attorneys in court where they are respectful but firm. It is a very professional courtroom. A judge that really genuinely likes working with all of them, if not maybe too much, because it does seem that Judge Judge likes to be really in the mix on what's happening. And I think that's why we saw him set a May 14th, 2024 date for a motion to change venue. I think this motion is a bit premature. The prosecution argued that as well, but the defense said they need to have this motion heard sooner rather than later because if they need to move venue to change it to a different county, different location, they're going to need to block out a courtroom for upwards of three months for this trial to take place. So they need to know that sooner rather than later, though it is very hard to do that when you don't have the jury selection process underway. We will see what happens on May 14th. If I had to guess what this judge was gonna do, I think he might get to the end of the hearing and realize that under the case law, it is a bit early to make this decision and he might take it under advisement for future hearings, but we'll see. But Corey Richens, y'all. Do you remember this case with Corey Richens? She's accused of poisoning her husband with fentanyl in Utah, but she also wrote a children's book about grief and was starting to promote that book when she was arrested over a year after he had passed. More information is coming out in that case with a recently unsealed search warrant for Corey Richens's mother's phone. And law enforcement said the reason they wanted to get to Corey's mother's phone is not only did it seem that Corey and her mom were in close and frequent contact, but that Corey's mom had shown disdain for her husband, the victim in this case, Eric, and that Corey's mom had been connected to an unusual, unexpected, and somewhat questionable death of her romantic partner back in 2006. At that time, Corey's mother's partner passed away very unexpectedly from an overdose of oxycodone. Law enforcement brought that up to get this search warrant, saying that given that unexpected and unusual death under unusual circumstances, the unusual circumstance being that Corey's mother had recently become the beneficiary of her partner's estate. But given that she was also there the night that Eric Richens passed away, law enforcement wanted a full search of her cell phone and all of her kind of digital um, information connected to that cell phone. I imagine that we will see some of this coming up at trial, but this did happen in May, 2023 and we have seen no charges come forward as to Corey Richens' mother at this time. We also learned in the Richens case that Corey had taken a plea deal to a misdemeanor assault case related to the assault of her sister-in-law, her late husband's sister. We heard about this in the detention hearing when I covered that hearing. The sister-in-law spoke and talked about the day that she went over to Eric's home and saw Corey trying to break into Eric's safe, but the sister-in-law had become the executor of Eric's estate 
that had been changed unbeknownst to Corey, and she was trying to get into that safe with a locksmith. The sister stopped that because as the executor of the state, she could, and Corey assaulted her. The sister relayed to court that day and in other areas, including the police report, that it took more than three people to pull Corey off of her when that happened. Corey was charged with the misdemeanor given a diversion program wherein she either had to take a quote unquote thinking errors course or a grief counseling course and pay a thousand dollar some odd fine and then the misdemeanor would be dropped and dismissed. The prosecution is saying that the time has passed and Corey did not complete either the thinking errors class, yes, that's what it's called in Utah, or the grief counseling. Corey's lawyers submitted paperwork indicating that she had gone to grief counseling, but that was before the date of this plea deal, so it wouldn't necessarily count. The court set that for a evidentiary hearing if Corey is convicted, they will probably give her time served on the misdemeanor because shortly after this all happened, she was arrested for the murder of Eric and has been in custody since that time. Lots of interesting stuff going on in the Corey Richens case, even though like Idaho, so much of that criminal prosecution has been sealed. But it is set for preliminary hearing on May 15th, 2024, wherein we should see quite a lot of information about this case as the state seeks to prove that Corey Richens is the one who committed the murder against her husband, Eric, by a standard of probable cause. That's a hearing just in front of a judge. I haven't covered a lot of preliminary hearings on this channel because a lot of the cases that I've covered have been prosecuted by indictment, which are secret proceedings. So it'll be interesting to get to cover this preliminary hearing and we will see much more information when we do that. So some really interesting hearings coming up in May trial coming up again in April for Karen Reed. So if you're interested in that case, be sure to get the app because I will be covering it once the evidentiary phase of the trial begins and we get to opening statements. And with all of that, this has been the quick bits. Lots going on this week over on the main channel, including a breakdown of all of that new evidence in the Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrand case. Yes, they've pled. Yes, they are on their way to prison. Yes, their sentences will be determined by the court. But the prosecution in that case released a massive amount of new information. And on Tuesday, we're going to go over it together. So until next time, Law Nerds, this has been the Quick Bits. I'll see you soon. For deep dives into the stories that I covered here, you can find them on my YouTube channel at The Emily D. Baker and The Emily Show Podcast. I stream every Tuesday and Thursday. The podcast goes live on Wednesdays. And if you want to stay in the loop with everything I'm doing, receive the fastest notifications out there and get more Law Nerd community, join me at lawnerdapp.com, our free app for iOS and Android.